Cool. All right, I'll introduce our next speaker. Um, please join me in warmly welcoming Phil Sturgeon. Um, how are you going? Uh, Phil is a bike nomad who creates API design tools for stoplight.io, uh, writes articles and books about pragmatic API development, systems architecture, and runs a rainfor uh, sorry, not a rainforest charity, uh, a reforestation charity. Uh, which I'm sure does benefit the rainforests. It's called Protect Earth, and it's planting trees to fight climate change, which is pretty cool. Um, Phil's going to be sharing some API horror stories. And as always, if you have some questions, um, pop them in the chat. And if we have time, we'll do a short Q&A after Phil's talk. Thank you, Phil. Everyone, uh, it's a little early for me over in the UK, but. Uh... <laughs> Bear with me, the coffee kick is kicking in slowly. So today I'm talking about a bunch of horror stories from an unnamed co-working company. Um, yes, that one, um, but legally not that one. Um, bunch of different problems, um, infinite different problems. I was asked to, to join the company um, to help solve their API problems. And um, yeah, they had all sorts of uh, bonkers stuff going on, like API A would talk to B, C, D, and E um, entirely synchronously in web threads was probably part of the main problem. Um, some of these APIs would take two to five seconds to respond on a good day um, and 20 to 30 seconds on a bad day. And seeing as they were chained up, that could take quite some time. Um, they suffered from both overfetching and underfetching, which means you have to make, um, you're making requests that have way too much information in them but you also have to make lots and lots and lots of requests to get everything you need because the database is just normalized instead of being based on what people actually need. Um, there's no HTTP caching anywhere. So you have to make lots of these very slow requests every single time you want the information, even if nothing's changed. Uh, there's weird stuff like error formats would be um, di different APIs, which is a little common but different versions of the same API would actually give you subtly different uh, error formats. So um, people would often kind of think they were putting a string into, into the interface and it would just come up with like error, object, object, because JavaScript. Um, so customers would see this all the time. Uh, auth was enabled per endpoint, um, but the testing for, for the entire API was done as unit testing. And um, that meant they were kind of attacking it at the class level instead of HTTP. So they would just disable testing. Um, and that meant that a lot of sensitive production endpoints just didn't have any authentication, uh, which is not what you want ever. Uh, no APIs have any documentation at all. So let's dig into this one a little bit because that is a huge problem. While I was trying to figure out why everything was so bad, it was hard to see. Um, the more I dug into it, the mindset was like, we're too busy for documentation. We don't have any time. Um, so let's just like rewrite it if we're struggling. And that is not a good approach. <laughs> um, basically, that sounds a bit ridiculous, but this is literally the basis of, of a lot of the API design first versus code first stuff that I've written about. Um, you can see some of this on my blog, APIs you won't hate. Um, I would plan the API somehow, whether it was on a whiteboard in a meeting, um, just on a Slack chat somewhere, like a random doc or something, um, and or, or literally just on a napkin, just write it down on paper. And then they'd share that napkin around. Um, they'd write a bunch of code and just kind of like, yeah, just stuff. And then like a month or two later, it would be ready for some customer feedback. And hopefully the customer wouldn't have too much feedback because they spent a month or two writing code. They now didn't have much time left to implement that feedback until it was time to deploy. Uh, so once it's deployed, it's in production. Maybe it's not quite what the customer needs, but whatever, close enough. Um, and then the mindset would be, we'll write the documentation later. We've, you know, we've been working really hard to get this out. It's out. Let's just celebrate that. Um, we can do the docs later. But right now we have a few performance issues to fix. Um, a few extra features to add, uh, you know, random random tech debt to solve, or we have a different project to go rush on. Um, so then a new customer would appear some months later. There's no docs um, available. So they go and ask the API developers to tell them how it works. And they've mostly forgotten because they've been working on another project. 
Um, they look back at the code and all the awkward rewrites they had to do to try and make that thing performant <laughs> means that it's really hard to read what the code's actually about. Um, so they'd end up either making a new global version, so version 4, 5, 12, um, or with a new name and new concepts, because uh, that might actually meet the customer demands. And um, planning somehow, showing the napkin around. And this just happens over and over and over again. Um, But one of them is um, the, no clients would ever be able to use the newer versions of the API. Um, you have one through 12, and, and most of them are still being used because the the API, the new API has been designed for another client's requirements. And they pretty much talk to one client at a time about what they need. So version one, two, three, four aren't really four different versions. They're um, client A, client B, client C, client D. And that means that. Um, yeah, it's just not useful for them. But even if they could try and there's there's no way for them to try and figure out how they could use that because there's no documentation anyway. So they'd have to like look at another client's code base and figure out if they could kind of retroactively use that API. So a lot of these horror stories or, or just moans, I guess, are gonna are gonna come with a, a few solutions. And one of them is the API design first workflow. Um, it's a huge simplification of how things work. It just involves writing your open API first, which is the part people think is extra time. It's really not, it's generally quicker. A lot of companies report speeding up like 60% um, by, by using this. And you basically design the open API first using something like Stoplight Studio or any of the other editors around, or you can write YAML by hand if that's your thing. Um, you then can have these uh, mock and doc tools that just take that open API and make a mock of your API, which can act as a prototype and people can try making requests to it um, and find out if they're making 100 requests because you normalized your, data, uh, your, your API as a database um, or whether they're, you know, whether the information they need doesn't exist or if it's in the wrong format. Um, and then you just turn that same uh, file into documentation. So you can use that to get customer feedback really quickly, which gives you more time to iterate before you have to start writing the code. When you do uh, get to writing the code, you can use that open API to um, simplify the code base. So in the past, you'd kind of write down all of your validations in the model and then a bunch of other validations in the contract testing and a bunch of other validations on like the controller to give good errors and say like, this is a string and this is an email and this is something else. Um, you just handle all of that with generic middleware um, so that the middleware can say, hey, this string is required or this should be an email address and it just rejects stuff that's invalid. Um, and that means you can deploy the code with documentation already because um, the docs are just running off that open API. You know that API is correct. Um, that open API is correct because it's powering your code and powering your contract tests. Um, and then when they want to request new functionality, when the clients have stuff they need doing, um, you've already got an up-to-date open API that you can just like add a new endpoint to or add a few more properties to. So it's just this really nice way of keeping everything up to date. Still very new, people are switching to it, but it's a thing. Stoplight IO, work for them, got a hoodie on for once. Um, you can use that, there's a bunch of free stuff on there, there's a bunch of open source tools. I'm not really trying to sell you anything, that's not what this talks about, but it totally does this. I call Cache Stampede Cluedo. Familiar is when uh, like the, the performance and stability of an application is kind of based on having a really good cache. Um, so like every request coming through this API would need to make a request to like one or five different APIs and that would be wildly in performance. So they just kind of shoved a cache on it um, and that's fine until the cache breaks, right? So the stampede is all of a sudden, um, all of these requests are unleashed uh, on your dependencies and they just start like washing things away. We had this one monolith that was being attacked by a client and we only had the clue Faraday 091, which is a really popular HTTP client. Um, look on the, uh, the GitHub organization and just type in like gem Faraday to see which one it was. And it was all of them. Uh, all of our apps used it, but the, luckily they were so bad at keeping dependencies up to date that we could actually use that as a unique fingerprint to find out which app um, was doing the, the damage. And so we looked through them all, 090, 081, and we found that like the one of the applications had this, this specific version. So we just took out the server um, 
and and that you know broke stuff but it stopped the entire company being broken because our monolith was no longer getting uh, you know murdered by all these extra requests um solutions here are like set a user agent as the most basic thing you could do say you know hi i'm app name um chuck a version or a hash in there if you can in case there's any weird deployment issues it's really going to help you trace transactions um using a service mesh can can solve this they often come with something like open telemetry baked in and it also lets you control um which apps can talk to which uh and then you, you narrow down your search a lot because you kind of know what's talking to it and a service mesh really is a huge help with the next biggest problem here which is the distributed monolith um microservices uh are pretty great unless you don't design them very well and then they're worse um and there's this brilliant quote by scott somebody and uh it says if you switch off one of the microservices and anything else breaks you don't really have a microservice architecture you have a distributed monolith um and that might sound a bit weird like why do you need to turn one off just assume instead of turning it off like it turns itself off it breaks it crashes right um that shouldn't wipe out everything else. But the distributed monolith kind of never really starts off that way. It always starts off as a wonderfully designed uh, microservice architecture where there's all this clean separation and there's domain logic owned by these different things. And then over time, as more functionality is needed by different apps and different interfaces, um, you just start making more requests to more different APIs. And um, eventually what happens is everything talks to everything and you might as well just have had it in one code base because they could at least share memory that way. Um, but all you've done is add a bunch of network calls in, in the way and slow everything down. Um, and at unnamed co-working company, uh, this was pretty much how the architecture looked from as much as I can remember. That there, there were two huge mon uh, monoliths in the middle that required everything and everything required them. Um, and then loads and loads and loads of smaller apps and APIs and, and everything else. Right, so this isn't just spaghetti, this is pretty much exactly what they had. Uh, one of the biggest problems were that there were just random, really slow things would happen all the time. Um, there were no timeouts set anywhere. And so you quite often see these like transactions taking 30 seconds. And the only reason they, they were only 30 seconds is that Heroku would cut them off at 30 seconds. They could have gone on a lot longer. PIs and external services taking a really long time would slow down everything. So this is New Relic. Um, you can see the, the dark green thing at the top spiking hard is the web external. And so for some reason, this is just averages as well. This isn't even 95th percentile or whatever. For some reason, this app, um, and that, that spikes up the request queuing as well, which means requests coming in don't have any available like web workers to, to respond to their request. Um, so some API has spiked and that means that now this API is doing poorly because again, no timeouts. Um, that can be a bit of a weird theory to like get your head around a bit, but let's say we've got a client who's talking to service A, service A is talking to service B, there's a few different endpoints on service A, and we'll just call one of them OK, which is just talking to the database or something nice and quick, um, and one of them is called slow, and that's talking to service B, which is having a bad day. Let's just say there's only six worker um, processes that, you know, there's, there's, there's dynos and threads and all these different kind of terms for different um, uh, capacity, but let's just say there's just six um, processes available. Um, and so a few requests come in for OK, one comes in for slow, gets stuck there for a while. Some for OK, some for slow, but two more are stuck on slow now. So now we've got three stuck on there. Uh, those will get served, right? The OK ones kind of pass through really quickly and a few more requests uh, uh, go into slow. Now everything's stuck on slow. Um, our server's basically down. This API no longer exists because it, its entire capacity is spent just waiting for a service that might not even respond. And, and none of the people that just need the OK endpoint can get it because there's nothing left to talk to them. API that looks like this, it's just doing nothing but request queuing. It's just waiting um, for ages. And, and this is going to be a lot of failures. Comically, throughput can go through because you're starting to just reject a lot of people. Um, so yeah, this, this would be a huge problem in a company where everything required everything because you'd have one API just randomly go down, right? Um, so members network API was like Facebook for co this co-working company. For some reason, they made their own. 
And it would mean that if the team had any sort of problem, any sort of understandable, reasonable problem, like um, they run a migration that locks a huge uh, table, didn't really you know, plan that, um, and, and queries start taking ages, or they add a, they add a new like and uh, criteria to a MySQL query, and that skips an index. So now something's taking a long time when it used to be quite quick. Any of those things, anything that affected performance on the members network API um, could basically take out everything around it because uh, anything that required that would then start to go really, really slow and processes would get stuck waiting for it to respond. Um, and because there was such independency between everything else, those systems would then go down. And because everything you know, requires one of those, the whole thing's dead. Uh, so this would happen all the time. The entire company would just crash and, and burn and everything would be on fire all at the same time. And the um, post-mortems would always be like, oh, well, the entire company crashed because this API had a problem with their migrations and we should just be more careful with migrations in the future. And they never really address the serious issue. And a lot of the time, people would just bump up their server instances. They just increase the dynos more. Um, but there's a real world problem going on, which is there's a climate crisis and throwing more resources at poorly designed architecture instead of fixing the architecture is exactly how we've got to the point where the internet is currently responsible for 3.7% of, um, of global emissions, which is about as much as flying. Um, we as software engineers might not be able to do much about people flying too much, but we can definitely stop wasting resources um, on poor architecture. Because right now, 80% of the internet is API requests and we control those here. There's a few solutions there. If you with a good separation of concerns, don't start adding network calls. It doesn't always need to be microservices, right? Um, maybe start off with a monolith uh, and then you know spin out things that make sense based around functionality, not just normalizing your database because then everything has to sync with everything else. Um, create, create SLAs um, and stick to them. Set timeouts on every call. Uh, expect to fail and then do something smart. You can queue requests, you can back off, you can hide features that aren't working right now from your interface, um, but don't just like let everything crash. Um, it's a blog post uh, about this on APAs you won't hate, taking a timeout from poor performance. It's pretty simple. Most HTTP clients will have some sort of timeout option. There's often quite a few options. So if you use Faraday, um, this timeout will be five seconds. This request cannot take more than five seconds. It will give up. Um, and then the open timeout is like an extra option that says, if the server hasn't even started to like do stuff by two seconds, give up. I'm not interested. It's clearly having a bad day. These numbers are quite high. I wouldn't put this in a web thread. Um, we did do it there because before it would take like a minute or something. So five seconds is better than a minute, but this is still really slow. You want most stuff to be doing stuff in way less than a second. And, and if you have to change how the code works to do that, then you know you should. This one was funny. Uh, Busy day in Australia, nobody poops. Of the architecture and um, basically when people turn up to go to their office on the first day of the month, everyone comes on the first day of the month. It's a very busy morning because people are at the front desk trying to get their key card so they can access the building. Uh, we need to, the, the front desk uh, team would assign uh, key card A to Fred and then Fred could go and do whatever on his floor, on his building, places he's allowed, use the bathroom. Um, the and order signing key cards to people was really bad. Um, it would always fall over. And that was mostly because there were three servers around the entire world, West Coast, East Coast of America, and other, and everything in the rest of the world fell into other, which isn't so bad when you've only got a few places around. Um, and it wasn't even that bad when we kind of got quite big it was still spread out just enough because uh, most of the uh, most of the growth was in the states but when <laughs> when the real world situation looked a bit like this it meant the other was pretty busy and so australia just being you know the first for time zones uh, if they start to have a really busy day then it would just thrash the whole system as soon as asia started to get on board um and because no one had any timeouts anywhere there were no circuit breakers there's no way of avoiding bad bad behavior um, it meant that the wobbly keycard API would start to crash. And that meant that everything was broken. Um, the main user and company uh, API would crash, uh, which meant that the front desk team was sitting there um, trying to uh, add this keycard, and it might take a minute or two to, to respond. 
Meanwhile, there's a queue of people literally out the door and they keep trying and trying and trying and trying. And uh, eventually they just have to say, I'm sorry, Fred, uh, here's, um, oh, I'll let you in the front door, you go do what you want. But then they couldn't go to the bathroom because that needed a key card too. So they'd have to come downstairs and be like, excuse me, miss, can I use the toilet? <laughs> and uh, this happened every month, it was really bad. And because the user and company monolith um, was uh, also handling OAuth tokens, it meant that the entire rest of the company crashed too. I was like, uh, they said their logging system didn't show anything more than 100 milliseconds. Um, and we, we tracked them doing two minutes thanks to using a traffic proxy. Um, we didn't have any particular trust in them fixing it anytime soon. I copied and pasted all of the code from the, uh, all of the keycard code to a new service. It was still synchronous. It just literally moved it to a different server and put a timeout um, and redirected the traffic. And that meant that the keycard service would still crash, um, but it didn't wipe out the entire rest of the company. A service um, that would use background workers to queue up all those requests, which kept the rest of the company, uh, the rest of the architecture working nice and happily. Um, and it just meant it might take a while to get your key card added, um, but at least it wouldn't be completely on fire. And we could send them an email saying, hey, nearly there, or hey, it's done, pop downstairs, grab your key card. And an SLA for third-party services, pipe external traffic through uh, proxies, um, avoid hitting APIs in the web thread whenever possible, and uh, especially if they're not under your control and use background workers to sort things out. I quite enjoy it was the mutually assured destruction problem. The, the diagram, if any of you noticed that this might be an issue. So these two mega monoliths would require each other. Um, and not just, you know, A needs B and B needs A, but A needs B to solve A's request. Um, oh, sorry, A, you know, A needs B and B needs, anyway, I'll show you. When you try and request user information from the user and company service, it would uh, it would be a huge blob of JSON, like 200 kilobytes, like sometimes thousands of lines, especially for the collection. And it could take 10 to 20 seconds. This is because they've mixed together uh, user, basic user information, user profile information, user locations to show what buildings you're allowed into, and user companies, um, which show which companies you're part of, and user, companies, locations, which is all the locations that company has access to, and that might have employees as well, which have other locations. It was just, it was way too much stuff. And this was all by default. You weren't like including this option that you were just getting it, whether you wanted it or not. That meant that whenever a client made like a, whatever the request was to subscription and billing, it might look for some basic information like the locale, right? Like this one little line that says ENGB. If they just want ENGB, um, they're having to get the entire user resource, which is going to the user and company API to solve it. But because that information has been jammed into the response by default, uh, user and company isn't in control of like which um, locations and subscriptions. So it has to go back to the subscriptions API. And that makes two requests, um, one to get the user's memberships and find their locations, and one to get the company's memberships to find their locations. And those responses were pretty slow on a good day. Um, and so 20, it might take 20 seconds to put all that stuff together. And what sucks about this is that the subscription and billing API doesn't even care about that information, but it's being forced to wait for this other service to call it to solve its, its mental. Um, and what that meant is that the user and company API, if for any reason it started to have a slow time, like the keycard service problem or anything else, um, then it meant that the subscription service, uh, subscription API is starting to go slow too or vice versa. But either way, if either of them got slow, they both just get slower and slower and slower <laughs> until one of them crashed. And then that meant the other one crashed. And then of course that meant the entire company is, is, is down because they all require one or both of these uh, mega monoliths. And I call that, you know, that's a double knockout, <laughs> right? Just everything's down, nobody wins. Uh, so the real simple solution there was, if you're designing a new API, don't jam all that stuff in there in the first place. But uh, we just had the locale information on a new endpoint so that they could just get that and then you know cache that and it's problem solved. So solutions there. Uh, stop designing for HTTP 1.1. The, the front end community stopped um, doing image sprites and CSS combination and JavaScript combination a long time ago because HTTP 2 is faster. Um, so use that to multiplex uh, multiple requests. Um, if the clients want more data, they can ask for it. That's what a HTTP request is. You only get what you want. It doesn't mean 
it all as GraphQL. It just means design your APIs a little better. Um, good blog from Fastly on how to do that. Uh, timeouts and circuit breakers uh, can really help with um, making sure simple requests succeed and then only the slow things fail so that you know the problem is with the specific parts of the application that are broken right now. And um, get an API architecture and governance team to review your changes. If you want to do governance, Stoplight helps with that. You can design all your APIs, you can review them in there. That is everything. So if there's any time for questions, that would be cool. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, we've got a little bit of time for questions. And um, we do have a couple. Um, the first one, I'm very curious about your answer to this one. Um, a lot of the issues that you brought up, uh, you, you pose some solutions to those issues, but a lot of the issues um, looks like they could have been um, the result of sort of a cultural attitude in the organization, especially the not not documenting and then just we'll rewrite it. That seemed to be like a real, um, let's just get it out as fast as possible, even if it's not as fast as possible long term. Um, in terms of if that was the cause of some of these issues, how, how do you find trying to implement these solutions or suggesting these solutions? Do you see a lot of um, opposition to that? I mean, people are used to doing things kind of the, the code first way, where they just write code and kind of figure it out later. And um, that that can be really hard from an uh, kind of an organization level, because when, pe when it's just coders doing coder stuff, um, they don't always have the entire architecture in mind. It's just kind of a case of like, I'm writing this code here, and I'm going to go and talk to that API there. And they treat it more like a function call that happens to go over the wire than like as part of this bigger thing. Um, and that's, you know, not like, oh, engineers are dumb. It, it's more like there is a specific role of, you know, um, uh, like a lead architect that needs to be in a company. And that's that's really often overlooked um, because, yeah. you know, when deadlines are tight, you can't blame people for just trying to get their thing done. But when lots of those kind of small decisions are made, um, it, it just basically problem and you need people working on things like api governance you need people implementing standards with you know style guides um using things like spectral you need people kind of looking at oh you're adding this endpoint that talks to that Ooh, i wouldn't do that like that's already re requesting itself um because when there's lots of layers of abstraction hiding what's actually making the api requests just looking at the code isn't always enough you need to have like uh, you need to say like if you want to talk to this service you need to add that to the service mesh so that we can see that you're trying to talk to that service instead of you just making a function call which makes like five requests in the background and you had no idea it was doing those and it just does it now um so yes yeah, so things like service mesh things like good devops practices and things like you know architects and, and governance review all of those things can help but you need buy-in from the top because trying to do it from the bottom is the struggle i had at unnamed company and everyone fights you even though you're making everything better it was really painful to like beg them to let me help. Uh, <laughs> and then they don't tell me what to do. I'm like, well, things are on fire. And then I changed it and they're not anymore. So I don't know, maybe listen to me. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a, like a nightmare. Help, help me help you. I just want to help you. Um, man, crazy, good stories. Uh, I enjoyed them very much. Unfortunately, um, there were a few more questions, but we, we run out of time, it's 4.20. Um, so I have to wrap up, but um, uh, maybe if people want to talk in the chat, if you're around for a little bit, maybe you can answer if anyone has questions. Um, uh, but yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Loved your stories. Awesome. Um, well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, those who have uh, watched our speakers at uh, today's APIA days, that's the end of the program in this stream. Um, don't go away. We've still got at 4.20 uh, that I'm cutting into. Uh, we've still got the lock note um, speech uh, with Petra. So, so go check that out. Um, check out the partner thing. Uh, get involved in the treasure hunt. Do that treasure hunt. Yeah. Have a great day.